I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, July 11, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Marilyn Ryan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of U.S. Navy sailor Xavier Martin, a 2010 graduate of Lansdowne High School who died in service to our country off the coast of Japan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair, I recommend that we remove item E from tonight's agenda. All those in favor of that change, please raise your hands. Is it unanimous to remove item E from the agenda? Very good, it's unanimous, thank you. The agenda as amended uh, will go forward. Um, First or next on our agenda is um, the selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing <laughs> to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign up cards for this evening have been placed in this box to my right and the first 10 drawn will be our speakers for tonight's uh, public comment portion of the meeting. And the first task of our newest board member, Ms. Josie Schaefer, is to draw those 10 names. Diana Bergman. Cynthia Boyd. <coughs> Chara Patara. Brenda, Fyf Brenda Pfeiffer, and yeah, that's it. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Well done. Uh, well <laughs> done. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, next on our agenda is um, uh, our new superintendent's report. Ms. White. <laughs> You, Was Mr. that Chair. family in the back, Ms. White, that started the applause? <laughs> All BCPS family. <laughs> But thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to uh, all of BCPS, including our teachers, our parents, our community members. Um, I can't tell you how humbled and honored I am uh, to serve in this capacity, and I just would like to thank you and thank the board for your support as well. In addition, I'd like just to take a moment of personal privilege to also uh, thank Dallas Dance for his leadership over the past five years. We've um, had a wonderful run together, and we've seen a lot of growth in our students as well, and so I do wish him well well in everything that he's doing and thank him for his leadership and his mentoring. And welcome to our newest board member, Ms. Schaefer. Mm -hmm. um, so Ms. Schaefer, I'd like to extend a warm welcome uh, to you. And uh, she is a rising senior at Pikesville High School with a strong track record of leadership in student government and the National High School Model United Nations and political campaigns as well. And she's an, also an active member and volunteer with Keep Punching which aims to end brain cancer. So welcome, Ms. Schaefer, to the board. So Just a quick note on some of the priorities um, for the school system and uh, the way that I see my vision in terms of moving our work forward. All summer, I'll be working with leaders and staff to support two focus areas uh, for the new school year. You, many of you have already heard me talk about literacy across the content areas and school climate to in, that would include also a focus on student behavior. So while we're not changing course, these shifts will impact our teaching 
teaching and learning and will move us forward as well. Uh, when I speak about 21st century literacy, I'm not only talking about reading and writing, I'm talking about students being able to not only consume information but produce information as well across the content <coughs> areas uh, so that students can be successful not only in college but in their, uh, their careers that they pursue as well. And technology will help us to personalize learning and es especially when we're talking about these 21st century literacies. A uh, school climate is another area that we'll be focused on this year, um, and where we have we're doing well in terms of the, um, the the area of school climate. But where we're talking about student behavior, we can do a little bit better. So the best way that we can prevent behavior uh, problems is through engaging and effective instruction. And so we want to make sure that we're looking at school climate and student behavior in three categories, and that is prevention, restoration, and logical consequences. And we want to make sure that we're supporting our teachers and our principals and our students every single day, but particularly as it pertains to administering logical consequences when it comes to student behavior. Uh, we need tremendous effort on all of these uh, fronts, particularly for prevention and restoration, and we want to make sure that our staff has our full support in doing so. A little bit of good news for us, um, finally, um, in terms of full day pre-K. All three of our full-day pre-kindergarten programs at Halstead Academy, Hawthorne, Sandy Plains Elementary Schools have demonstrated high-quality standards and are accredited through June 2020. The rigorous year-long validation process with the Maryland State Department of Education included a thorough records review and multiple classroom observations at each site addressing communications, administration, and teaching and learning. So I'd like to take a moment to thank our staff and leaders, including our early childhood supervisor, Sharon Ward, uh, stat, the stat teachers in those buildings and principals as well, and Rebecca Lindsay, who is the Judy Cent uh, Center facilitator at Hawthorne. So again, this is a pretty big deal to become accredited for full day pre-K, so congratulations to those schools. Finally, I would like to again express how honored I am to have the opportunity and the privilege to serve as your superintendent. I'm, I'm deeply dedicated, as you know, to this school system, and I know that we're going to have an incredible year together. So thank you again. Thank you, Ms. White. It's now an opportunity for a couple of words from, from this seat. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the board, I want to welcome Josie Schaefer. Um, and uh, there will be great benefit to the entire board from the perspective of a student. And Josie, you follow a long line of wonderful student board members, uh, and we look forward to working with you. Uh, I know we're all going to be jealous of your energy, that's for certain. <laughs> I also know that the entire board uh, looks forward to a clean slate start with our new now on duty superintendent, Verlita White. Uh, we will have a board retreat this Saturday to, uh, to begin our, uh, our new relationship. Uh, July also marks the beginning of the second half of the calendar year, but really marks the beginning of the first half of the 2017-2018 school year. Um, and I know that our wonderful teachers, administrators, and support staff are all full blast getting ready already for uh, the upcoming school year. So even though summer is uh, just past the 4th of July, uh, the school system keeps working ready and uh, ready in the system for uh, the students just after Labor Day. Um, you've already seen Josie in action pulling names out of the, out of the hat here, but now you're going to have a chance to first hear from her. Josie. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Josie Schaefer, and I will be a rising senior at Pikesville High School. I'm so excited to be serving as the student member of the board for the upcoming school year. Recently, I have been working with Baltimore County Student Councils to plan their fall camp, a three-day leadership convention to help students in the county find their voices on their own student councils. I look forward to working with BCSE in the future and more events to come. I've also begun to meet and work with BCPS staff. I'll be meeting with BCPS TV to be creating content Content for the students. With their help, I plan on increasing and empowering the student voice in the near future. Uh, as the student representative, it is my privilege to sit down and meet with the diverse student body of Baltimore County and gather information of what they'd like to see change in our school system and bring back this information to actively reflect, reflect what the students want during every board meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you, Josie. Yeah. Our next agenda item, item I, is public comment. Uh, we first will have advisory and stakeholder uh, groups. The first one to be the Baltimore County Student Council representative, Jacob Turner. Jacob and Company. <laughs> Um, good evening, um, my name is Jake Turner and I'm here representing the Baltimore County Student Councils as their president for the upcoming school year. And I am Noreen Badwe and I will be the Public Relations Director of the Baltimore County Student Councils. So although school may be out, we are already busy at work planning for the year ahead. Um, we also selected our executive board for the next year and are pleased to have a great group of motivated, passionate, and dedicated student leaders. Um, these students bring about an unparalleled drive for growing the student voice in Baltimore County and solving the problems that are occurring in all of our schools. I have full confidence that, these, uh, board, that this board will accomplish great things during our tenure. Um, your turn. <laughs> We're also really glad to have had the opportunity to meet with Josie, the student member of the board, several times uh, throughout the year to ensure that our year is going to be great and uh, to plan for a lot of these events. So we're really excited as an organization and as a bunch of students to work with her on improving the student voice, not only through Baltimore County Student Councils, but throughout uh, the entire system. Additionally, um, as Joji said earlier, um, her and I will be visiting many schools throughout the county, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools, um, and we will be meeting with students and talking about the issues that are occurring within their schools. Um, and through these conversations, we hope to work through the problems and find out what needs to be addressed, and we'll report back to the board. Um, thank you very much for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Our next speaker is Tabco's representative, and that is Glenn Gallant. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, and members of the board, and special welcome to our new student representative, Ms. Schaefer. Uh, my name is Glenn Galante. I'm the executive director for TAPCO, and I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of TAPCO President Abby Baton, uh, who couldn't make it. She's out visiting her mother-in-law in Vancouver. So uh, she has, a, every year they go out there, she's 100 years old. She still lives by herself. That's fantastic. Yes. Uh, we want to give a special welcome to Mrs. White uh, for your new position as a superintendent. TAPCO uh, is looking forward to working with you in a collaborative way uh, to make ba uh, Baltimore County Schools so much better. Uh, the role of the superintendent is extremely important because of the decisions that you make not only affect the teachers and the staff, but everyone. Uh, so it's important that we all work together as stakeholders and we can, you know, look at, you know, the different things and, and make those, you know, correct you know, crucial decisions. Uh, and knowing that the teachers, you know, there's a whole different perspective a lot of times when you talk to the staff and find out what's really happening down in the trenches. And we really look forward and we had a, a wonderful uh, little reception where you came and we really appreciate that. One of the things I do want to update you on is that TAPCO has a work group uh, that's been working now for several months on discipline. Uh, and we ask that you hold off on your discipline policy. We've talked about this before. Uh, there's so many important things happening. They're actually meeting this Thursday. They come in at night and have had several meetings. Um, we really look forward to working with you in the future on that policy change. Uh, and we hope that we can really have a collaborative uh, discussion on that. And also one of the issues that have come up recently uh, has to do with Governor Hogan's uh, switch to after Labor Day. Uh, many of our staff members probably didn't budget correctly uh, now that they have a little bit longer summer and you know maybe you know their pay might be a little bit short because they didn't budget out over the summer like they normally would because of the longer summer and we're hoping that in the future you know the staff could have choices as to whether or not to spread the pay out over a 10 month period over a 12 month period you know we're hoping that there's not a one size fits all but that we'll be able to work something out where uh, members can make that choice what's best for them and their families who's everybody's situation is different when it comes to finances so other than that, it's been a busy summer, like you said, in the school. Uh, it's been a busy summer at TAPCO, uh, lots of things happening, and uh, we look forward for the rest of the summer and then the coming school year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galante. <coughs> Our next speaker 
is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's Megan Stewart Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Ms. White, members of the board, good evening to all of you. As many of you certainly know, the recurring themes from CCAC the last school year were staffing and struggling readers. With regard to staffing, we want to thank the board for the following new positions that we received through the budget. 14 special education teachers to support our elementary schools, one additional board, board certified behavior analyst, six speech and language pathologists, four occupational therapists, and two physical therapists. This all comes at year two in a three-year strategic plan, and we will continue to discuss the need for additional staffing in the next year. With regard to struggling readers, we want to thank the board for approving the Orton-Gillingham contract at your last meeting. As many of you know, teachers come out of Orton-Gillingham training with strategies that are appropriate for many struggling readers, but also with a multi-sensory approach, which is considered the gold standard for teaching students with dyslexia. Recently, the board requested information about iReady and DreamBox, and some have asked the question of what we think about these resources. We can certainly talk more about that in the future, and especially in relation to the recent Orton-Gillingham contract. I want to clarify that for us, they are two completely separate and both very necessary resources. Specifically with reading, iReady is one part of a larger literacy plan, and its aim is to make meaningful use of a student's independent work time while teachers may be in other small groups. In addition, it provides reports that help teachers identify areas of need. This is an important daily tool in the classroom, and we support its use for these purposes. iReady's differentiated resources benefit our students and help overworked teachers who can't possibly provide that themselves at all times. And reports on student performance provide valuable information. Orton-Gillingham, on the other hand, is a specific approach to reading instruction that can be used once an area of need is detected or once a student is understood to be dyslexic. Our data show that with iReady, there have been reductions in the number of students reading below grade level in grades one, two, and three. Additional specific resources, such as Orton-Gillingham, I hope, will be used to target the remaining students who don't respond with further practice in that everyday curriculum. I hope that answers a couple of the questions regarding these resources, and I'm happy to answer further questions at any time. I hope you are enjoying the summer, and I look forward to seeing you in August. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, and that's Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Board of Ed members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, PTA Council Communications Chair, speaking tonight on behalf of our President Emery Young. Ms. White, congratulations on your appointment as interim, su interim Superintendent. PTA Council looks forward to working with you to support the students, parents, and teachers of BCPS. There are many important issues on tonight's agenda, including votes to drastically increase spending authorities for two instruction programs, iReady for English Language Arts and Dreambox for Math. While PTA Council hasn't taken formal positions on these programs, we have pointed out the opportunity costs tied to funding technology at the expense of hiring teachers to reduce class sizes and bringing on board greater numbers of social workers, guidance counselors, pupil personnel workers, and behavior interventionists to address troubling and widespread student behavior issues and to support BCPS students as a whole. During the 2017 Maryland General, General Assembly, we supported legislation to develop objective safety guidelines for the use of digital Oop, sorry, the digital devices in Maryland public schools. We testified regarding the dangers of too much screen time in terms of decreased interpersonal skills and human interaction, addiction, and negative effects on eye health, emotional well-being, mental health, and social brain and fine motor development. These are components of the Student Wellness Policy 5470 to be discussed later this evening. 
Other contracts under consideration tonight focus on conscious discipline and social emotional learning. It was heartening to read in Dr. White's recent address that student discipline will be a major priority in this new administration. PTA Council attended the curriculum committee <coughs> meeting at which conscious discipline was first presented. It appears to be a creative, holistic approach to handling difficult behavior issues. This and assessing the social emotional learning environment in BCPS are positive steps. We have two, re two points to make related to safety and discipline. The first concerns the safety of drinking water at a number of schools, including Sparrows Point High School and Reisterstown Elementary. We're aware that these schools will no longer receive bottled water next year since the water from their drinking fountains has been, has been purportedly deemed to be safe. We questioned by whom the tests were done and, and request to see the results because we were informed that no such tests had been performed. Finally, regarding student behavior and student wellness, National PTA has passed a resolution on restraint and seclusion. It rejects the use of mechanical and chemical restraints by school personnel and demands that the use of seclusion must include constant direct monitoring of the student's welfare. PTA supports the use of positive or non-aversive interventions, thereby limiting the use of restraint and seclusion on students. The resolution concludes with a promise that PTA will advocate for the engagement of parents in the decision-making process, not only in an IEP or other education meeting, but in every aspect of a student's education with regard to the use of emergency restraint. This policy is greatly needed for the safety of students, teachers, staff, and administrators. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Case, and I'm not sure whether it's Bill Lawrence, Tom DeHart, or both Bill Lawrence and Tom DeHart. Look at that. Uh, just to get started, thank you very much uh, for the time. I hope that uh, you'll be kind to us on the, on the three minute limit. I'm actually here for three things. One, uh, one hasta luego, as we <laughs> uh, would say, I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, number two, I could not uh, live with myself if it, I did not congratulate Valita White uh, on being your interim superintendent. Uh, congratulations and, and all the best. Uh, and last but not least, to introduce the new executive director of CASE, Tom DeHart. Good evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Gillis, Interim Superintendent White, and members of the board. Uh, I've come full cycle. I spent a career in Baltimore County Public Schools as an elementary teacher, middle school teacher, middle school assistant principal, alternative school principal, middle school principal, and finally a high school principal. I've spent the last 11 years at the Maryland State Department of Education researching leadership theory and creating and facilitating professional development opportunities for principals, assistant principals, and executive officers in all 24 Maryland school districts. It's been well documented that the single most impact on student growth is the teacher in the classroom. A meta-analysis conducted by RAND for new leaders quantified that teacher impact at 33%. While that may sound low, it's still the most important factor. While there's a myriad of factors that contribute to the remaining 67%, research has shown that the second only to the teacher, the principal and by extension assistant principals, uh, is the second most powerful influence on student achievement. Again, Rand was able to quantify that influence at 25%. This 58% total uh, influence on student achievement is important because it's a number that's under our control. Relative to the leadership component, it's important that we continue to identify and develop leadership within the existing employee ranks in a systematic and purposeful fashion to build the bench of future assistant principals, principals, supervisors, and coordinators. Since tonight is the all-star game, let's use a baseball model. The most successful teams year in and year out have strong minor league systems where players learn the game in the mold of the major league team. Those successful teams then complement their teams by an occasional free agent uh, who may have a skill set missing in that organization. This process supports team vision, continuity, culture, consistency, and loyalty. Once promoted, ongoing and purposeful professional development is just as important. Again, in baseball terms, those teams have spring training each year as well as batting practice and coaching on a regular basis. I look forward to working with the executive leadership and the board to help ensure that we recruit and prepare the absolute best candidates and then support their work after their promotions. 25% of student achievement cannot be overlooked. It is, after all, the reason for our professional existence. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. DeHart. And thank you, Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> Hasta luego. Mm -hmm. And our last uh, advisory and stakeholder group speaker is um, a representative from the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council, and that's Heather Bergen. Good evening. Happy summer, everybody. I'm so shocked to see how busy it's going to be here tonight. I thought it'd be summer and be all laid back, but anyway. Um, on behalf of the Northeast Educational Advisory Committee, I'd like to uh, welcome our new superintendent, Ms. Verletta, Ms. Verletta White. Um, we look forward to working with you and your staff, and we hope that possibly you'll be able to attend one of our meetings um, in the coming school year. Once we get all that planned out, we're working on that now. <laughs> Um, one of the biggest issues in the Northeast area is overcrowding and unbalanced enrollment in the schools. And it was a little bit disappointing to see um, that facility issues were not addressed in um, Ms. White in your welcome letter. Um, because it's a huge issue and, and we don't want it to fall by the wayside. Because I know there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of things that need work. Um, but we hope that they won't be ignored under your watch. It's simply not okay to have schools at 120 to 130 percent capacity, schools that have brown water coming out of the pipes, schools, uh, water that's undrinkable from the water fountains, schools with flooding issues, mold issues, et cetera. Um, we ask the board to please remember that these, issue, these issues when looking at spending funds on other things that are not as fundamental as where our kids are going every single day, where they sit every single day. Um, facilities need to come first, and the health and safety of our students, teachers, and staff just can't be compromised. So please, um, we hope that you'll keep that on the forefront. And um, we wish you the best of luck, Ms. White, and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next item on the agenda is general public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from in interested uh, citizens. As appropriate, we will refer uh, concerns to the superintendent to follow up. Our first speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I want to welcome Ms. Schaefer. Congratulations for joining the team. And Mrs. White, I'm very excited you're part of this team and leading us forward. Um, today, I would like to ask for follow-up. Um, as the year came to an end, I had written to several board members regarding restraint, seclusion, um, and exclusion policies. We don't have a public guideline in BCPS um, for us parents to see. Um, in addition to that, I had requested for the discipline policy to create a sub policy to um, explain that process for the parents and the public. Um, I would also like to see, if possible, um, identifying a crisis prevention intervention certified personnel at each um, website for each school. They're trained currently to prevent a crisis for a child. And us parents know our children. We know which ones are higher at risk to be put in an unfortunate situation like that. And I think us parents need to know who um, that individual is that could help de-escalate the situation. Um, fortunately, this is something that does happen. A lot of people don't like to talk about it. It's a very sensitive subject. Um, but it's also something that concerns a lot of parents, even parents that are not aware what the challenges are for this child. So if someone's coming to visit the, vi the building to visit their child, they might walk into the hallway where another child's in crisis and needs supports. And that impacts everybody, from the child experiencing it, from the teacher and educator that has to hands on do something and make such a serious decision to do something so impactful that leaves um, a, a lot of uh, emotional, um, I would say, trauma after such an experience. And even other children that are nearby in the building that hear something like this that are not used to something like that. 
So having a sub policy to clearly explain this process so we know what to expect out of BCPS in a consistent manner from every schoolhouse site, from elementary, middle school, and high school level. Um, will benefit the whole community as a whole, BCPS, so we know what that expectation looks like. And um, it's better to have that guidance, in my opinion. So I understand we're going to, we've been waiting off on the discipline policy, but it's very important. We have to make sure we get it right. So thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Cynthia Boyd. Welcome to Superintendent White and Ms. Schaefer, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am a parent of elementary and middle, middle school students in BCPS, and I'm speaking tonight about the contracts proposed for iReady and DreamBox, and the use of MAP scores to evaluate their effectiveness. I've watched the meetings where the BCPS data about them was presented, and I do have some concerns. BCPS, however, is not alone in the lack of high-quality evidence about these programs. In fact, recent research has highlighted the dearth of evidence about personalized learning programs such as iReady and DreamBox. Dr. Payne from RAND recently led a Gates Foundation-funded report on personalized learning that researchers refer to as a cautionary tale, as the popularity and investment in the trend far outpaces the evidence base. The National Education Policy Center, which is independent, is even more lukewarm about the effectiveness of personalized learning. In fact, there's very little um, peer-reviewed evidence to support using DreamBox or iReady that meets the basic standards of the Department of Education's What Works Clearinghouse. Furthermore, Johns Hopkins researchers recently asked whether any research established whether iReady and MAP give teachers relevant information about their students' learning. Their conclusions are as follows. The lack, quote, I'm sorry, the lack of a research based on iReady and MAP as means for improving student learning is both surprising and disappointing given their widespread use as well as their cost. To be clear, the negative findings of a single study, it was the only one that addressed the question that was available, should not be taken as conclusive. Rather, they illustrate just how important it is for states and districts to understand precisely what research suggests about these two tests and where we have important unanswered questions that deserve peer-reviewed external research studies commensurate with the widespread use of these assessments. When considering the use of MAP data, a few points um, seem important to consider. Much more growth in MAP appears all over the country in the first half of the year than in the second half of the year. For students that stay in the same spot, for students to stay in the same spot or percentile on the normal distribution that underlies MAP scores, they must achieve projected growth. 50 to 60 percent of students nationwide meet their projected growth. That's the way the norms work. NWEA, which runs MAP, cautions that using the percent of students achieving projected growth as a statistic for evaluation can be problematic. The lack of um, uh, the lack of evidence about learning was recently acknowledged by the CEO of DreamBox, and I think it's even more sobering when you consider that $46 million was invested by venture capitalists in DreamBox. I hope this number gives us pause about the opportunity costs. They are expecting big profits. Do we know what the effect would be of more reading specialists or smaller class sizes? It feels a lot like public education will be lining the pockets of the very wealthy. My personal concerns about these program include time and gamification. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chara Patara. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. My name is Chara Patara, and I am the stat teacher at Woodbridge Elementary School. I'm here tonight to speak to you about the importance of receiving the funding for the iReady program for the 2017-2018 school year. Last school year, iReady made it possible for teachers to provide responsive and customized independent work while they taught small groups of students based on their targeted needs. All the while, iReady kept our students engaged in meaningful independent work, which improved our students' reading levels tremendously. Based on the iReady diagnostic given at the beginning of the year, 19% of our first graders, 
34% of our second graders and 60% of our third graders were on grade level, overall in reading. By the end of the year, 81% of our first graders, 77% of our second graders, and 75% of our third graders were on grade level. We went from 38% of our first through third graders on grade level at the beginning of the year to 78% of our first through third graders on grade level at the end of the year. That's an increase of 40%. Our students spend an average of only 45 minutes a week using this very beneficial program. And they also were given the opportunity to use this program at home, and they continue to use it over the summer. Taking away this valuable resource from the students seems unimaginable to me, considering the amazing results that were accomplished in its first year of implementation in our school. I have charts that show the growth of our students from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. And as you can see, this was the beginning of the year, our first grade students. And you can see the blue, blue is good. That means they were on grade level. And then this is the end of the year data, the blue of where they were. So the results are really amazing. Again, this then was the third grade side. Please consider this informa information when you vote on approving the funding for the iReady reading program for the 2017-2018 school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bittar. Our next speaker is Brenda Pfeiffer. Good evening, and Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am the mother of two children who go to BCPS schools, and I'm speaking to you tonight to ask you not to extend the contracts for Dreambox and for iReady. Uh, like BCPS, my family has a limited budget. We only have so much money coming in, so my husband and I need to consider the many things we could spend our money on, and then prioritize and choose to spend our money only on those things we feel are most important and most beneficial to our family. Likewise, BCPS has only so much to spend, so it's important that you choose to spend the money on what's most likely to have the greatest benefit for students. Like many ed tech programs, Dreambox and iReady do not yet have enough actual scientific research behind them proving that they will have the academic benefit we're looking for. In fact, um, as was mentioned earlier, a recent New York Times article showed that the CEO of Dreambox herself acknowledged that there is no solid evidence that Dreambox actually improves learning. An additional $4 million to extend both of these contracts above the millions already paid is a huge price tag for something with questionable and yet unproven results. Yet there's a plethora of research supporting benefits of things we know work like smaller class sizes, additional staffing in areas like special ed and ESOL, additional support staff such as counselors and PPWs, and even the Orton-Gillingham that was mentioned earlier. So I do applaud BCPS for um, make, taking a step forward to start getting some teachers trained there. Now, um, I have heard uh, many people talking about the benefits of programs like Dreambox and iReady. One benefit is that they're more engaged in school, and to that I would like to say this analogy. If I served ice cream for dinner every night at my house, I'm sure my kids would be much more engaged in dinner time. But the real question is, are they getting the nutrition that they need from dinner? So computer programs may get the students more engaged, but are they really getting the education and learning that they need from them? And that's the question we need to make sure we're asking. So the bottom line is, every decision you make is about what will be best for the students of Baltimore County. And until there's definitive proof that these programs will help our students make significant academic gains, the best choice is not to extend the contracts of Dreambox and iReady. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pfeiffer. The next item on our agenda is item J, and that's personnel matters. And for that, we invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. <clears throat> Evening, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'll like board approval for the following personnel matters, termination, <coughs> retirements, resignations, 
leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters J1 through J5? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Next is consideration of administrative appointments, and we call on Ms. White. Chairman Gillis and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal Chadwick Elementary School, Principal Charles Mott Elementary School, Principal of Dundalk High School, Assistant Principal Lansdowne Elementary School, Assistant Principal Lyons Mill Elementary School, um, Assistant Principal Southwest Academy, Assistant Principal Summit Park Elementary School, Assistant Principal Towson High School, Assistant Principal Western School of Technology, Assistant Principal Woodlawn Middle School, Interim Chief Academic Officer for the Division of Curriculum Instruction, Community Superintendent, um, based in the Office of the Superintendent, Pupil Personnel Worker, Office of Student Support Services, and Specialist of Equity and Cultural Proficiency in the Office of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments presented in the exhibit to K-1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Back to you. Okay. Um, Mr. Gillis and members of the board, I'd like to present to you our, our newly appointed administrators. I would like them to stand uh, to be recognized when their names are called. Uh, we have Kristen Alkir, who will be the new assistant principal of Woodlawn Middle School. And as is tradition, Kristen, do you have family with you tonight? And we ask that they stand to be recognized as well. We also have Jennifer Audlin, specialist in equity and cultural proficiency in the Office of Equity and Cultural uh, Proficiency. Again, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Okay, please stand. We have Dr. Mary Boswell McComas as Interim Chief Academic Officer in the Division of Curriculum Instruction. Mary, do you have anyone with you tonight other than me? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. We also have Nicole Bridges, who will be the new assistant principal at Towson High School. <laughs> Nicole, anyone here with you this evening? <laughs> Congratulations. On, Please stand. stand up. We have Ms. Christina Byers, who will be the new community superintendent in the office of the superintendent. <laughs> have here with you this, tonight. Okay. You One of our wonderful principals. Congratulations. We also have Don Hoffmaster, who will be the principal of Charles Mont Elementary School. There you are, Don. With you, Dawn. This evening I have my husband, Sean, with me, and three of my four children, Elise, uh. Bryce, and James. Congratulations. <laughs> we also have Tara Kutch, who will be the assistant principal of Western School of Technology. <laughs> Tara, is there anyone here with you this evening? <laughs> Please stand to be recognized. Congratulations. We have Samantha Mail, who will be the assistant principal at Lyons Mill Elementary School. Who do you have with you tonight? I have my husband and my parents, brother, and sister. Please stand.
Catherine Miller, who will be the principal of Chadwick Elementary School. <laughs> We're here with you, Kate. Please stand. <laughs> We'd like to congratulate Tamisha Peterson, who will be the pre personnel worker in the Office of Student Support Services. Is there anyone here with you this evening? Please stand. I'd like to congratulate Jennifer Pete, who will be the assistant principal at Summit Park Elementary School. And who do you have with you? Congratulations. And Larissa Santos will be the new principal of Dundalk High School. So who do you have here with you this evening? Please stand. Congratulations are in order to Elizabeth Turner, who will be the assistant principal of Lansdowne Elementary School. Elizabeth, who do you have here with you tonight? Um, I have the principal who got me here. Uh. <laughs> my new principal, Mr. Price, and my two best friends, and my parents are watching in New York. Wonderful. Please stand. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Theodore Wellsant, who will be the assistant principal, Southwest Academy. <laughs> is there anyone here with you this evening? Please stand. Congratulations to all, Mr. Chair. That concludes. Oh, that was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Next on the agenda, item L, is action taken in closed session. And for that, we call Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. <clears throat> Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in a quasi-judicial capacity. This matter was heard in oral argument as the appellant requested to be heard by the Board. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in closed session in that matter, which was uh, hearing examiner number 17-33. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? Second. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nussbaum. you, and the order will be on the desk. Very good. Thank you. Next, well, we'll give people a second here to... <laughs> always, always clear out the room. I don't know why. <laughs> All right. I don't know. I'm the one who moved it. Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Moved it along. Save those until last. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next item on our agenda is item M, and that's contract awards. And for that, I call on the chairman of the Co Building and Contracts Committee, Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. The Building and Contracts Co Committee uh, met earlier this evening and are forwarding items M3 through M16 uh, to the full, full board for approval. Uh, the, bo the committee is recommending those uh, Items all were recommended unanimously, but except items nine and ten, but all come with recommendations from the, the committee. Items one and two come with no recommendation as we discussed item one, but didn't finish the discussion on item two. Very good. Is there a motion to accept items M3 through 16? So moved. Is there a second? Uh, I guess there isn't a need for a second. A second. Right. Um, anyone want to uh, either uh, segregate any of those or is it uh, discussion on those? Mrs. Miller. Yeah. One, two, and six, please. Well, we're, we're not on one and two yet, so number six. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion on three through 16. We're going to segregate number six. Any others that we need to segregate? All right. All in favor of approving contracts M3 through five and M7 through 16, please say aye. 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 All right. Those, those contracts are approved. Uh, we'll now go to uh, number six. 
Mrs. Miller. I just had a few questions. Um, could you explain the program to us? Uh, yes, I'd like Contract to Contract 6 is the ask. Safe Schools Ambassadors Program. Uh, Michael, thank you. Please introduce yourself and go forward. <laughs> um, Dr. Michael Ford, I'm from the Office of Safety and Security, and I'm here for April, uh, who is on vacation. Great, thank you, yep. Dr. Ford. So uh, the Safe Schools Ambassador Program, this is actually um, a request to continue with their third year. Uh, the first two years have already been um, granted and finished out. Um, this third year will help us with sustainability um, and efforts to have in-house expertise so we don't have to pay outside vendors anymore. Uh, the program has grown from 669 kids, uh, students trained the first year, to 800 students trained uh, with additional 134 staff members that are trained in this protocol. Um, as you know, with um, when we're talking about um, climate and culture, uh, if you think about the PBIS framework, this is just one of the tools in the toolbox. Uh, so it's not a magic pill, uh, one fits all, but it will add to the uh, tools we already have in our toolbox. So we're just asking for the continuation of it. Any questions of Dr. Ford? Mrs. Miller. So what is the purpose? What does that training include? So the training is, um, we've known for years um, that students were very reluctant to get involved when they saw bullying situations or situations um, that we frown upon in the schools. Uh, the Safe Schools Ambassadors uh, gave these students the expertise, the confidence to when they saw something brewing uh, to the point where it was gonna be a disruption to the school climate, that they had the tools to intervene and stop it before it got to the point that it was a fight or bullying. So it's, it's giving them skill sets uh, to intervene um, where the adults aren't around. And I think in the uh, first year, we had an average of 2.5 interventions per student trained. So if you do the math and multiply that by 669 students, that kind of gives you an idea. And then last year, uh, even with 800 students trained, so we trained more, uh, the number of interventions actually went down to 1.5 per student. So it's starting to show that it's, it's being grasped by the students in the pilot schools, uh, and it's starting to get some headway. Great, I applaud those efforts. Mm -hmm. um, also, it had mentioned that there are 20 participating schools. How are those schools selected? So they were randomly selected uh, through the partner who's doing the analysis, which is University of Maryland. Uh, so the schools were selected in the feeder patterns. And then we also did the same for the uh, comparison group. It was the schools were selected in their feeder pants. It's just uh, randomly selected. Okay, so you're saying if a, an elementary school was selected, then the middle school that they feed so into? I, it, it was actually in reverse. It was the, okay. yes. All right, that yeah. makes sense. And um, are we trying to target then the schools that are maybe the most dangerous schools or the highest risk populations? So I, I think once we get some of the uh, analysis back in October, um, that will kind of guide the ship as to where we go with the program. Um, but I think just using the data that we already have from different sources, rather be bullying data, suspension data, um, office referrals data, it would make a logical sense to go to those schools who have the higher numbers first once we're ready to expand. And will the board be giving a report when you get that data back? Absolutely. Okay, appreciate it. If you Thank request you. it. I'm requesting <laughs> it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, You're welcome. Any, other, any other questions, Mr. Ford? Doc, Dr. Ford, I'm sorry. All in favor of approving contract M6, please say aye. 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 All right, that contract is also approved. We're now on to M1, which is um, the I ready? I ready. Yes, I ready, ready contract. Yes. And, and Mr. Chair, I would um, respectfully ask that our, um, our new interim CAO, as well as our community superintendent, um, come forward to give a brief overview of how we uh, go about selecting instructional materials. And um, just to give a, 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 just a reminder to the board and information to the public as well, um, just a very brief overview, but I think it will help um, in determining how we go about selecting our instructional materials. Good evening. 
uh, again to um, pick up as Ms. White um, um, introduced. I will review with you the routine procedure that we go through in identifying instructional materials that are then brought forward to the board for approval. We follow the procedures that says as set forward in policy and rule 6002. So essentially what happens is an instructional need is identified uh, at the district level or at a school level. Uh, then the content offices assemble a selection committee. That selection committee follows the processes outlined in 6002, and there is a set of evaluation criteria that are used for helping to select um, resources. Once they have narrowed that down, uh, they put forward a recommendation uh, to the executive director of academics. During that process, a public review uh, process is conducted. It then moves forward to the chief academic officer, who then moves it forward to the board curriculum committee for review and recommendation. It then moves forward to the contracts committee for review and recommendation. And then finally to the final board for full approval. And so the only thing I would add to that is, um, as Dr. Boswell McComb has stated, uh, we do use uh, policy in rule 6002 for this process. And both of the instructional material, all three of the instructional materials uh, that you have in front of you for contracts this evening went through that process. Um, specifically, iReady went through that process and was originally approved in April of 2014. And Dreambox went through that process and was originally approved in October of 2014. All right. Thank you both very much. Now, questions, Mrs. Hen. Thank you. Um, Dr. McComas, at what point in that process that you described is cost taken into consideration? Um, that would be part of the initial review. Uh, the review selection committee looks at all the resources, and then part of that is that they look at the cost. And where does that fall in terms of a rubric I'd imagine that they use in their evaluation? It's, it's one of 10 criteria, and it's not weighted necessarily. It's stated in the board's rule, and also, um, it's not cost, it's value uh, relative to cost. So it's not necessarily the lowest cost, but what is providing the most value for the dollar. Do the initial evaluations occur with as cost blind or value blind, whatever terminology you choose to use? I, I believe so, but I would defer to anybody who served on that committee. So they would look at the instructional aspects that are being considered. So if you're reviewing uh, a resource for um, social emotional learning needs, you would look at what are those uh, academic or those um, qualitative pieces that the program has. You would look at those for the instructional piece. Side by side with pricing or is, it is that decision made blind to the cost of that resource? That would ultimately all be laid out and so that you could compare across to see which different resources bring with it different elements to its package. And so you really have to look at it across the board. I guess what I'm Cost asking is the considered point of my question so that is it's not, it is not, so again, the, the most uh, paramount piece of would be the alignment to student needs and academic needs and also looking at alignment to standards and as Dr. McComas said, that instructional value. And then there's also a cost analysis as well. So that cost is not void of the, it's in, of the discussion. But the first um, aspect has to be about our students and our student need and which um, products and services and um, instructional materials would best uh, serve as that, that instructional need. And then, of course, we consider cost as well. Of course, and what I'm really asking is two products, all other things equal or relatively equal, at what point does cost become a determining factor in that process? Right, so again, we're looking that instructional value will supersede the cost. Um, it's not the same process as if we're selecting um, um, other types of desks and, and those kinds of things, furniture but we're looking at instructional value first. If everything is considered equal, then of course we would look at uh, the, the, the product that would give us the greatest uh, value for our dollar. Thank you. Yes. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I have a number of questions, and I know other members do, but I just wanted to dovetail with Ms. Hen um, about the um, costs, um, because they are all costs, and of course there is value, and we talked earlier in Building and Contracts Committee about that around uh, different roofing projects that we're doing. We don't always go with the lowest cost, but we go with what we think is going to provide the best solution at the best price, and that's reasonable. Um, one of my concerns, however, is when we're talking about um, cost, as our PTA County Council representative was mentioning, there's the opportunity costs within our system for many, many needs. And even within uh, curriculum, I attended the last uh, curriculum committee meeting, and uh, uh, Mr. Kearns put forward uh, new books that are being selected for gifted and talented advanced academic programs. Um, but it's being phased in because we don't have enough money for to get all the books all at once. So um, what we've heard from our community is, and on the board, is to have reasonable costs for reasonable results. Um, we also heard from CCAC about staffing needs, that we've made improvements, but there's still improvements needed. Um, and I'm looking at the overall stat budget, the proposed six-year instructional digital conversion plan, which is uh, this spreadsheet that was presented to us this year from our then superintendent, um, and it was also presented to us the year before. And it has changed from that year to this year, um, where the uh, interactive classroom project for $41 million um, was taken off the list um, with a note that the county um, took the funding for that and used it for digital devices. So that's a, a, an initiative that the system hoped to do, but then the county um, apparently made the decision that we don't have that those funds available. Um, I'm also curious about how the actual dollars add up, because in this STAT uh, instructional digital conversion plan, um, the curriculum resources for this coming year, 2017-2018, um, is Five million two hundred and twenty-four thousand and change, and these added additional costs eat into that quite a bit. And I know we also um, approved other software contracts. Um, so I'm just curious, how does this actually all fit into the whole budget of when we hear every week about all of the um, the needs that our system have? So I'm just curious, especially related to the to the budget piece, and maybe Mr. Saris could discuss that, because it's not just about is it effective, but is it effective over and above other things that our, our teachers can do, um, and given that there are additional needs, curriculum needs, facility needs. Um, I also want to point out that um, it was pointed out to me that um, when we talk about things and people talk about oper our operating budget, versus our capital budget, and so it doesn't matter what we spend in operating because, you know, that's separate from capital. But that's not the case. The case is every dollar we spend is important relative to every other need that we have. Um, if, in fact, in just the last year, $20 million of operating <coughs> funds were uh, transferred back to the county in order to help with accelerated air conditioning. So um, we really need to evaluate every single dollar to be the best possible resource for our students. And I'm not seeing the results that we got, the um, performance indicators that say that that's the case. So if someone could speak to the, the curriculum resources budget line item and how that number, because it doesn't show that it increases the next year, but if we approve this contract, that number should increase. No, that's not correct. Um, the, uh, cur the, the budget for curriculum is not part of STAT. The uh, web hosted services, is that the section you're looking at, 5.224 million? It's labeled curriculum resources. Right, so that consists of web hosted services, which is primarily digital, con digital and media content that's provided through our libraries and online and available to students. Um, the license fee, obviously, for Microsoft um, is uh, related to the operating system for the devices. Uh, BCPS1 
uh, and the associated client software are for the portal that delivers uh, all of our digital content coordinates, uh, student information, uh, teacher uh, curriculum guides, uh, shared content, and so forth. So none of this amount includes what we spend on textbooks, supplemental resources, and other curriculum and instructional materials. So if I'm to understand what you're saying, this six-year instructional digital conversion plan does not, in fact, include all of the costs for the digital conversion. Well, what we're talking about here is a supplemental instructional resource. It is not part of digital conversion. It's being delivered uh, through our devices, but it is not, uh, it's, it's in lieu of other curricular resources, whether they be print uh, or some other media, that we would buy regardless. They're part of our uh, instructional materials and curriculum. And uh, Ms. Causey, I would also add to that to talk about, and, and thank you for uh, raising that question about opportunity costs, because I think it's important for the board and for the public to understand um, the opportunity costs that do exist. So for instance, in this product, we have a flexible adaptive uh, product as, as well as Dreambox as well, where we have um, a diagnostic tool to see how students are performing, particularly in the areas of reading and math. And we're talking about literacy across the content areas. When we're looking at how our students are performing, I'm sure that this board uh, wants uh, to see some results as a result of it, particularly as uh, they relate to reading and math performance. So when we're talking about taking uh, the, the, this tool out of the hands of teachers, then what do we have to do instead? Again, this product is flexible, it's adaptable, it's, it serves as a diagnostic tool and as a, an instructional tool. Again, it, there have been three internal evaluations. Not only this current board, but previous boards have had the desire to have programs piloted and vetted uh, appropriately and uh, then to show pr uh, proven results. That has happened with both of these products. They have been piloted. They have, now we have seen the growth and the gains. We've talked about students g gaining a full year's growth in reading in half year's time. And again, we can debate uh, whether or not the, the measuring stick is the correct one. We believe it is uh, to bring it forward to you. We will be fiscally responsible in whatever products we bring forward to you. But we have heard not only from our teachers and we're seeing the results and from the evaluation that these products have given us the academic benefit. Right now, if we pull these tools away and then we're start, we will ask questions about student performance, particularly in the areas of reading and mathematics. So with this, um, when we're looking at reading and math, diagnostic and instructional tools, we need to be very careful about taking away those tools out of the hands of teachers. The opportunity cost um, lies in the professional development. Whenever we're introducing a new tool uh, or a new resource, should we have to vet additional resources to do what this flexible tool does? Again, we would then remove the flexibility. Are there paper pencil options to, to do that? Absolutely. But that means that we need a paper pencil option for diagnostic. We would need a paper pencil option for small group instruction. We need a paper pencil option for individual instruction. And so then you're looking at costs associated with not only those resources, but then you're also looking at professional development. At a time when our teachers are talking about teacher workload, um, that would be an additional professional development for our teachers to then have to learn three or four new systems for addressing uh, math needs and reading needs as well. So when you're looking at those opportunity costs, I would just ask that you would take all of those things into consideration. Other questions? Question. Mr. Yulefeld. I'd like to ask the question to those who are so concerned about the cost of this. How much are you willing to pay per student for the graphs that we were shown and the improvement that was shown? Tell me how much you're willing to pay per student. Quantify it. I dare you. <laughs> I can ask you the same thing about air-conditioned classrooms. Well, I'm talking about, I'm <laughs> about talking about a diagnostic and an instructional clean water. tool. How, let's put Thank a number you. on clean yeah. water I, because I'll we just heard about that. We'll take that as rhetorical. Yeah. Mrs. Eaton. I don't have a question. I just want to read a statement and some of the same things that Ms. White just said. 
I really like the program I ready. However, I've been asking myself, is the program really worth all the money? Many teachers have written asking the board to renew the program, and they stated that without the program, their workload will increase greatly. As a former teacher, the last thing I wanted was more work. Teachers would have to work on their own time to develop their own intervention material. They would have to do this for every reading skill taught for every student who's on a different level. Unfortunately, iReady is very expensive, but not providing this type of program will be more costly in the long run. It will hinder students' reading ability, which in turn will affect all other subjects. Not having this program means examining other programs and piloting them and then train the teachers. I also received many emails for advocating the, for decoding the dyslexia. They make a valid point about iReady not teaching reading skills like phonics and decoding after second grade. I don't want the dyslexic community left out because we spent so much money on iReady and now have to wait to secure money for dyslexic students. I hope that there is a way to purchase iReady and an intervention program for dyslexia. I would be happy to vote yes on both contracts. Mr. Birch. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. McComas, if I might, I just wanted to ask you, um, iReady and Dreambox, these are, you know, tools, isn't that right? That's correct. And they're instructional materials used as tools, is that correct? Correct. And under our Rule 6002, which we've heard referenced this evening, there's also a form that's available uh, under that rule, isn't that correct? Correct. And that, that uh, form, that actually provides for our parents and uh, um, even our students to use this form to evaluate these instructional materials that our staff, our teachers use in classrooms every day, is that correct? Yes, the correct provides an opportunity, the form provides an opportunity for them to pro express feedback, yes. And with regard to these two specific instructional materials, uh, has our system received any feedback utilizing this form under Rule 6002? Not to my knowledge. And we have had these two um, instructional materials already in Dreambox since 2013 or 2014 or so? 2014. 2014. Thank you very much. Any other questions about uh, contract M1? Mrs. Miller. I have more comments than questions. Um, as, a, as a member of the Safety and Technology Committee, I'm particularly concerned about the gaming features of these programs. That, that, that issue has been raised by stakeholders over time. Um, and really, even their addictive qualities. Um, now, I, I've been unsuccessful in the committee of getting device time data out of BCPS, but I know that both of these programs have usage requirements, and um, I think it was discussed by a stakeholder earlier this evening. Um, they even email reminders to students telling them how many minutes they've played or not played and what they need to complete to meet those quotas. Um, now, I did ask for a copy of the contract um, to see if that was actually part of written into our contract, these usage requirements. I have not received um, those contracts. I also asked if the board could be given access to BCPS1 so we could take a look at these programs ourselves, and I had asked that we would have that access before this meeting, but I didn't receive any response to that either. So there, there is a correlation, obviously, between cost and outcomes. And the more that we're paying for a program, we're going to expect a higher level of quality and more in terms of student achievement. We've had a month now that we've asked the system to justify the expense of these two programs, and I don't believe that that justification has been met. Um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that 
BCPS has a, just over 50% readers on grade level. Is that correct statistic? What can I say? Um, that's approximate. I don't have the number right in front of me, so I'm hesitant to give you a specific number. Okay. Um, so for me, I just, you know, we talk about opportunity cost. I can't justify this steep expenditure for these programs without really seeing those outcomes. And Ms. White said that there have been, it has been evaluated, but we're just not seeing that, especially for the cost of these programs. So I would support the board um, really starting to look at other options. Are there more comments or questions before we call the vote? M Ms. Schaefer. Um, I believe that in time, these two products will create exactly what Baltimore County will strive to be in the future, which is a customizable access for all students, um, no matter their learning curve or where they are on the learning curve, to achieve success in schools. Um, in the iReady in Dreambox input from the BCPS Association of Elementary School Administrators, uh, administrators, yep, that we were all emailed, um, a constant thing that came up is customizable or individual approach. This is something that, um, as a student, I always hear on the announcements or I always hear uh, the teachers are talking about from the higher ups. And um, I think that's why we were given devices, which is why uh, to be able to allow students to have a customized customizable approach to education, and I think that's exactly what iReady and Dreambox will achieve. Um, I think it's important for board members to see that how this affects the students in the classroom. Uh, recently, I've been on the Balt Baltimore County SMOB Twitter, and all over my feed is summer school students um, using Dreambox, using iReady in the classroom, in their summer schools. Um, there are students that take it home with them. Um, and it monitors students' progress, as it says in the document that we were given, and it assists schools with closing achievement gaps of lower learners. I think this program allows students that are maybe on the higher end to start using work, uh, start doing work that maybe the second graders are doing if they're higher in first grade, or if they're below, they can catch up while their teacher is doing um, small groups. I think these programs are, um, very important for what we're trying to do as a school system to uh, create an approach for all students to be successful. Mr. Stewart and then Ms. Causey. So I just wanted to confirm something I think that was discussed earlier, which is that if this board declines to approve these two contracts, that means that there is a gap as far as the tool goes for reading intervention from a software program perspective, right? Yes. So a follow-up to that then is, is there anything in the modification or in the underlying con contract that would prevent us from a board uh, from instructing you all to pilot a different program at the same time that we're using iReady and or Dreambox? No, we would just need to, uh, assuming you want to maintain one while exploring options, Correct. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly admissible. Mrs. Causey. I would just like to say that um, I agree with Ms. Eaton talking about the teachers and the workload and needing resources. Uh, the teachers in our system have been through uh, many, many dramatic changes over the last few years, both from the federal level, the state level, and the county level uh, with our own initiatives. Um, and I would like to make the motion that we amend contract M1 to provide funding as needed for one more year while we evaluate really the results in a, in a systematic, strategic way, including disaggregated data, including significant uh, input from our teachers in an anonymous, objective way, uh, including our parents, um, while we also evaluate other products that may provide the same um, benefit to our students. So that's the motion I would make. We I'll can take that as a motion to amend the motion to approve M1. Second. Um, and there's a second. Um, is there discussion on that amendment motion? Yeah, I'd like to discuss it. The, the, the contract uh, is only a two year contract. One year, nine months, I think. Yeah, well, one year, nine months uh, until April 30th, 19. Um, if, if you do this for one more year, 
uh, will go into next summer and then have about seven months left on it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, you might as well go through the term of the contract and at the same time, if you feel we ought to be exploring other avenues, then, then I can see that. Um, I, I just don't see any sense in, in putting a one-year term on this. Mrs. Miller. It actually makes more sense because then the break would be in the summer where we could then transition to a new uh, program. Mrs. Hen. Thank you. I think it comes back to what we've heard tonight repeatedly from stakeholders and board members, and that's the opportunity <coughs> cost. No one has demonstrated that there are not um, ample opportunities or amp equivalent other tools at lower cost available with the same outcomes. Technology is improving all of the time. I'm a fan of technology. I don't want to stall the progress. But at the same time, we have a fiscal responsibility to make sure that every dollar counts, as Ms. Causey said. If this were a system with no unmet needs and our students were in pristine facilities, climate controlled, this, we would not be having this discussion. There's no doubt that these are great tools. Do other tools exist that could accomplish the same outcomes? I'm not convinced that they don't exist. We've heard from stakeholders that they do. I would support Ms. Causey's motion in um, taking a look at some of those alternatives. Any other discussion on the motion to amend? Yes. Mr. Virch. You have just heard, quote, there is no doubt these are great tools, end quote. You heard me speak with Dr. McComas and ask her, these are tools, yes. These are instructional materials, yes. There's a means for folks to provide feedback, yes. That's an existing rule, yes. It's a form that can be submitted, yes. And in fact, have any been received? Negative. So I would encourage us to vote against this amendment. All right. All in favor of Mrs. Causey. I would just like to respond that how many people know about that versus our advisory folks that come, people that take the time to come to the board meetings to express opinions, not just their own, but also of stakeholders that they represent. So we have heard over and over every single meeting about opportunity costs of needs of our students. So yes, it is a tool. It appears to be helpful, but these results may also be happening because we've improved our curriculum by aligning to the Common Core standards. It could be because we're training our teachers better. To say that this, this program and these results are worth this money is yet unknown. And I am just suggesting that we make a fiscally appropriate decision and provide the teachers a resource they're familiar with for one year while All right, the this new on superintendent has the opportunity to pro the motion, provide the board the information The motion to amend is to reduce the contract from one year nine months to one year. All in favor of that motion to amend, please raise your hand. The motion fails. Now the motion on the table is the contract itself, M1, the iReady contract. All in favor of M1, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The motion pad. The contract is approved. The second con the M2 is the other contract still remaining. That is the Dreambox contract. Yeah. Dreambox contract. That's the math. Right. Ms. White, how do you intend to proceed on this? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Again, Dreambox is a, a supplemental um, program so that it provides, again, um, diagnostic information as well as intervention. Um, uh, resources for our teachers to use with their students in order to increase their um, math skills and abilities. Uh, we would ask the board to approve this contract so that we can continue to provide this resource to our teachers. Uh, at the Building and Contracts Committee, there was not discussion on this contract. Is uh, M Dr. McComas, do you have more to add, or is what Ms. White has said is very good? Um, all right, board discussion. Mrs. Causey. I would once again suggest that this is a very expensive program given the thin data that was provided to us on the um, improvements that are attributable to this program versus uh, improvements that may be attributable to other factors. So I would suggest that we modify this contract to provide for one year of use of this resource while the system under our new superintendent is able to provide better data to the board in addition to um, looking into if there is another product that's available. Second. 
All right, the motion is to have a one-year contract rather than a two-year, 11-month contract. Any discussion? Uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Moons, how many students are affected by Dreambox, or is it used for? Uh, yes, sir. It is used by all of our elementary schools, one how through How many five. students would you say we have uh, in our elementary uh, school? Approximately 62,000. So um, we have 62,000 children. Uh, we spent one, almost $1.2 million over, I presume, I don't know, a two-year period? Uh, since a three-year period. Three-year yeah. period. Okay, well, if you divide, that's, uh, that's about the 400,000 a year for 62,000 students. I don't think that's very expensive. Any other comments? All right. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, additionally, there were there's additional concerns <coughs> related to Dreambox that were um, already alluded to by, or actually specified by Ms. Miller and other stakeholders in terms of the gamification of education and other concerns about screen time, which have not, the board has never been given an answer about how much time the students are on, how much time is required of certain programs and what the data shows in terms of how that impacts our youth. Um, so for those reasons, I would suggest that we approve a contract for one year while we explore all of those additional concerns. All right, the motion uh, is Same to... Motion. Hmm? Same motion. I know, the oh, motion right. on the table that we're now gonna vote on is to reduce the contract from two years, 11 months, to one year. Mr. Uh, I don't know how many of you read our, our monthly book we get, American School Journal, but there was a recent article saying that uh, the playing of games increases a person's math proficiency. A very lengthy article. You ought to read it. Okay. All in favor of Mrs. Causey's motion to reduce this contract to one year, please raise your hand. The motion fails. The contract is now ready to be voted on is contract M2. Any further discussion? All in favor of M2, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The motion carries. All right, that is the conclusion of the building and contracts. Thank you, Chairman McDaniels. Next on our agenda is uh, public comment on policies. And the first of the policies is proposed changes to policy 1240. And Diana Bergman has signed up. Ms. Bergman. Policy 1240. Okay. So policy 1240, one, um, what I gathered is a um, policy statement. I had a question. Um, is this means that the final decision has to be made by the current acting superintendent um, if there's any kind of disagreement where a visitor, like a parent, is asked to leave the building because uh, there has been some kind of conflict with the with an administrator at the school site, or this I don't know, is, can I ask questions? Well, but this is comment time. Okay, comment. Not necessarily answer time. <laughs> okay, so my question was the way the policy is written from what I was trying to understand. Um, I understood it as the superintendent is gonna establish the procedure um, to governor schools for the office visit, and according to the state laws, any employee may demand identification, evidence of qualification um, for any visitor who desires to enter um, board property. Um, and I understood this is like the office buildings of uh, central office or school sites is what I didn't really understand the difference on it. Um, and um, if a visitor is to ask to leave because there's a conflict or a situation that could be resolved later. Are they banned permanently for the whole school year, or is there a way to work around that? So I wasn't exactly sure if the final decision falls on the principal of the school site or the superintendent. But um, 
it's not question time, it's just comment time. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, the next um, topic for public comment was policy 3200, no one has signed up. After that was policy 3209, no one has signed up. Next was policy 3310, no one has signed up. Next one was policy 3330, no one has signed up. After that was 3620, there was no one signed up. Policy 3640 uh, had no person signed up. And the last uh, policy um, is policy 5470, students, service to students, dash wellness. And there are two speakers, Cynthia Boyd is first. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Emery Young, PTA Council President, and Andrew Bodwater, who is chair of the PTA Council's Health and Safety Committee. We are pleased to see the Board of Education's commitment to the health and wellness of our district students articulated in the new wellness policy. However, it is disappointing to find that despite including the 10 categories of the whole school, whole community, whole child model from the CC CDC, and I have to say that about five more times Times, I'm pretty sure I'll um, get it wrong. Um, sleep is excluded from any consideration in the policy. The CDC, along with the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, and the National Association of School Nurses and Society of Pediatric Nurses, and others include sleep as an important component of wellness. These organizations recommend school start times for adolescents after 8.30 a.m. The Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene recommends school start after 8.00. BCPS students in regular high schools were on the bus as early as 6.02 a.m. in the 2016-2017 year. Magnet school pickups are even earlier. Early school start times like those in BCPS lead to chronic sleep deprivation for adolescents whose physiology makes it hard for them to go to sleep and wake up early as our school system requires. The accumulated sleep deprivation impairs their attention, memory, and judgment. It puts our risk, students at risk of depression, substance abuse, car crash, among other dangers. Districts with later start times experience tr lower truancy and disciplinary incidents and higher levels of student achievement and athletic performance. This summer, the National PTA passed a resolution similar to the one passed by the Baltimore County PTA Council in 2016, encouraging districts to work toward healthy start times for high school and middle school students to support their physical and mental health, safety, academic performance, and quality of life. An additional reason why sleep should be addressed in the wellness policy is due to the educational transformation of STAT. The American Academy of Pediatrics is very clear that the hour before bed should be device and screen free. This means middle and high school students must be able to complete homework without exclusively using a device, especially after extracurricular activities. This will require paper books and textbooks to continue to be available to all students to bring home and a balance of modes of homework and activities, of homework activities. We urge the board to consider the wellness policy to include student sleep. We ask the board to consider the impact of the district school start times on our students, the ability of families to adhere to the AAP's recommendation of a screen free hour before bedtime. While physical activity and good nutrition are important to good health, we must not forget the third component of wellness, sleep. We are not yet able to comment tonight on the corresponding rule on wellness, as we believe it's not yet available to the public. We believe family input into this corresponding rule, which is, includes all the details, is vital. The Baltimore County School Health Council has stated that recess should be device-free. As an example, we hope that this type of recommendation will be reflected in the rule. Please consider this as an example. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. So policy, oh, sorry, okay, so policy 5470, what really stood out to me was um, section C where the superintendent shall establish guidelines to implement the wellness policy that include but are not limited to. Number five, involving parents, students, school administrators, representative food and nutrition service, physical education teachers, school health professional, and the development review of revision of the wellness policy. Um, is there any way possible that involving parents in the terminology to allow the parent to be more engaged than just having them present as involved, like um, certain guidelines or um, 
training also available to um, make everyone involved in the school community culturally about making decisions while stereotyping. Um, my husband used to um, be an officer for equal opportunity and they used to do this training where they will make everyone in the team in the unit aware of when they make decisions based on stereotypes. And this training did a lot of role playing and interacted. So it made everyone more cautious and knowledgeable when this was happening. And this falls in the piece of supporting the child's um, social emotional well-being. Um, a lot of children are very capable of doing a lot of advances and making progress based on their unique ways of how they learn. But if they're stereotyped by one of our leaders, they might miss that opportunity to move forward and progress. So how can we all together improve the culture that's very important as far as the wellness um, and the well-being of the student? Another piece, too, is environment plays a big role in behaviors when we have high discipline concerns that parents keep sharing and the facilities and the environment where the kids are learning they need to be equitable and comfortable across the board because that will impact a child especially a young child when they're sitting in a hot melting little classroom and um, they're not available to learn because they're a little bit irritated and uncomfortable. So that also plays an impact on the well-being of the child. Um, yes, I am concerned that sleep was left out of this piece because that's very important. We need our children to be well rested as well as having the most important meal of the morning, which is breakfast. Um, other pieces just, um, having a well balance overall for the child and understanding each unique community and how it's function. Um, there's a social emotional piece that I think is missing and it needs to begin very early on um, when a child's three or two with early childhood and moving that forward and growing those building blocks until they graduate to help them um, resolve their problem, problem uh, their solving problem skills. Oh, the solve. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know. Okay, well thank you, my thank time's up. You. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is item O, board committee updates. It being the middle of the summer, I have a feeling the committee updates are gonna be thin. Mr. Yulfelder, audit. Um, we have an audit committee meeting next Tuesday. Okay. Very good. Building, building and contracts. No update for this evening. Um, curriculum has a meeting on August 17. Uh, digital safety. Ms. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, we met, I don't have the date in front of me, about two weeks ago. Um, I have a few uh, outstanding requests that I'm going to um, reiterate. Um, the oldest being the request for device time. Um, I, I've, I have been asking for a teacher survey as one means of getting unscientific data on student device time. Um, Back in April, I also asked for a report on device loss, breakage, and replacement. Um, and two months later, when we met again, I was told that we're waiting on it. Um, the, the problem that I'm finding with the way the Safety and Technology Committee functions is that it's two months between meetings. And so every step is a two-month wait you know, and everything drags out. So um, I'm going to um, ask that maybe we can get a little bit more information between meetings to move things along a little faster. Um, so we're still waiting for reports on device loss and breakage. Um, another request, which I mentioned earlier, was to give the board access to BCPS1 so we could see what the students are seeing. Uh, that'll just help to educate the board a bit better. Um, and I think that's it. Does, um, do any of the other members have anything to add to that? That's a good summary. Thank you. And uh, PRC, is there a meeting scheduled? Yes. All right, there's no meeting scheduled, um, and uh, I, it will be back on track soon. Next on the agenda is item P, board member comments. And we'll start on the, my far left with the good Mr. Hayden. 
Nothing for me tonight. Thank you. There you go. Mr. Stewart. <laughs> I'll be a little bit longer, uh, but I'll just say that I agree with comments shared by Ms. Boyd and on behalf of Ms. Young and Ms. Broadwater. I think that not only is it time to have the discussion about sleep and school start times as it relates to wellness, but also as it relates to our policy system-wide um, for school transportation and the other issues that are affected by it, um, stadium lights and so on and so forth. We're not asking for a wholesale change overnight, but I think it is time to at least get the study going. So I'll say that and also say um, welcome to Ms. Schaefer. Um, during, right after your remarks on Dreambox and I Ready, Ms. Eaton leaned over to me and said she's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just share that with you. <laughs> okay, he already said what I was going to say. <laughs> welcome aboard. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I do want to say thank you to Ms. Schaefer. Um, we're, we have been very fortunate with our um, previous student members of the board, but we're really excited about having you here and the potential that you bring and also the energy and enthusiasm that you have. It is very important to this board that we hear from the students and we hear that perspective. So we're really looking forward to your work. Um, also, I just want to say happy summer to everyone, um, but uh, for our parents and family members, um, that we want to keep our children engaged um, in learning and in being active in their minds and creativity. There's lots of resources available through our BCPS website. We've got uh, Glicks picks for uh, book selections and there's other things available on Parent University. Um, in fact, I was able to visit a, one of our middle schools was having a robotics camp. So there's lots of activities that are available for our students. Um, also, I would like to say that um, in terms of uh, the votes taken tonight for our resources for our teachers, that it is very important that we provide them tools. It is also very important that we understand the full impact of all of these initiatives and the costs around them because we do have limited resources and we have many, many, many needs of our students. And I would also like to say that while we can have um, differences of opinion about how to solve these uh, issues for our students and for our teachers and for the system, that I, I think it's very important that we respect the diversity of opinions, um, knowing that we all care. Um, but we do have different perspectives and we do have different uh, backgrounds. And we also, uh, many of us are reading a lot of the materials that are coming to us and maybe we all haven't read the same articles, but there's a lot of information that's going on right now with education and technology. It's a very moving target and it really is incumbent on the board and the system and the new superintendent uh, and her staff to work together to find the best solutions for the students. Thank you. Mr. Yulefelder. Um, I'll pass. As I'm just passing it over to, to Ms. Schaefer, I just want to welcome Ms. White again as our new superintendent. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys for the warm welcomes. I really appreciate it. Um, and as this ends, uh, I suggest to everyone to start uh, leaving the boardroom and start entering schools because it's so important to get that point of view of the students that you may not see from board docs or you may not see from articles online. Uh, the best uh, point of view you can get on any contract or any policy that's coming up for review is just talking to the students. So. <laughs> Mr. Virch. Um, I would also um, uh, welcome uh, the outlaw Josie Schaefer here. Um, we're very glad to have you. I would also encourage my colleagues to get into schools, preferably without one of the community superintendents kind of hovering around or an executive director sort of like monitoring you, you know, so that you can speak with students and uh, also with our staff. Um, uh, those are my comments for tonight. I would like to thank the board members that uh, supported a contract to take care of uh, some drainage and some erosion issues at our McCormick Elementary School. And uh, for those who were supportive of the uh, Ambassadors Program, please note uh, there are two high schools. One is Catonsville and all the feeder schools. There's a total of nine that feed into Catonsville that have those Ambassadors. But there's also Parkville High School, which has another nine schools that feed into it. And that Ambassadors Program has been in effect for some time. And we hope that that will continue and expand and, and generate positive outcomes for our students and for our staff. A safer and environment follows from order in a school and then learning comes next. Chuck? 
Thank you. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to briefly say I had a chance to interact with some of the curriculum writers at uh, Newtown High School uh, this week and how fortunate we are at BCPS to have our teachers writing the curriculum, those that really understand our kids the best and we're not uh, constrained by having something uh, uh, just uh, um, off the shelf passed on to us and and again we thank them as a board for the work that they're doing and then also to say just how much I appreciated the comments of Ms. Causey tonight um, because again even though we have a different vote or different disagreement it's not a dismissal of the points that are made and I think we can grow as a board if we begin to understand that uh, amongst us all thank you. Ms. Miller thank you uh, there's a lot of change happening in our system leadership right now, not only with the new interim superintendent, but also turnover on the board. And this really represents an opportunity for some positive changes and fresh ideas. So first, I wanted to welcome Josie on board. Very good job, Josie, on your first, um, <laughs> your first speech. Um, and also to congratulate Ms. White. I applaud Ms. White's focus on literacy, but especially um, on school safety, discipline, and school violence issues. Those have got to come first. Um, finally, as we fill those leadership positions on the board, I ask, express again my desire to serve on the policy committee. And so everyone, I hope you enjoy the second half of your summer. Believe it or not, it's half over. This is Head. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to join in welcoming our new interim superintendent, Ms. White. Ms. White, your enthusiasm and dedication to our students has been both apparent and contagious. So thank you. In a recent address to the board, I was both impressed and delighted by your comment indicating a willingness to share data with the board so that we can make the most informed decisions possible. As I shared with you, the Department of Education's Office of Education Technology recently published an evidence-based approach to evaluating education technology purchases. The model looks at actual usage, whether programs are being used as intended, and what outcomes or benefits are derived from use of the particular program. As a board, we need the information tools such as these provide so that we can make objective, evidence-based decisions when evaluating system spending. We are not a system, as you know, without needs. Every dollar spent carries an opportunity cost. It's the board's responsibility to ensure we are spending wisely in areas with the greatest needs and most significant impact on student achievement. It's easy to purport the benefits of a particular tool or service. It's much harder to demonstrate it. Could equivalent value be derived from less costly tools, freeing up resources for additional teachers, social workers, counselors, etc.? The intent looking critically at these purchases is not to delay progress, but rather to ensure we are prioritizing our spending appropriately. As Ms. Causey mentioned tonight, budgeted expenses are not set in stone. Unused dollars can be spent in other priority areas through the budget appropriation <coughs> transfer process with county council approval. Cutting unnecessary operating costs is one way to help BCPS fund urgent school facility needs. Every dollar matters, and we have to think creatively to address those many unmet needs. I look forward to the creative energy brought to the board by our new student member, Ms. Josie Schaefer, and would like, lastly, would like to welcome you, Josie, to the board. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Head. Uh, all of the uh, welcomes and greetings to Mrs. White uh, is a perfect segue for her to continue that theme. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, to the board, thank you um, for this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to uh, working with each and every one of you. I know that your hearts are in the right place, and I know that we can uh, be very productive as we work together uh, for the benefit of our students. And to Team VCPS, I am a little biased, mm -hmm. but I believe that this is the best team in the nation. Um, <laughs> I know that our teachers, our principals, our uh, business service providers, our bus drivers, our food service workers. They're all, I mean, we have the most hardworking staff I've ever seen. We have dedicated parents. We have tremendous community members. And most importantly, we have pretty terrific kids. And so we have to keep kids at our focus. And I just, I am really looking forward to this. Again, I am a little biased because I really do believe I am Team BCPS. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've come up through the ranks and I just know for firsthand the dedication of our folks. And I must say, although that this didn't go tonight as an appointment, 
I would like to take a, a, a matter of personal priv privilege to congratulate Michael Dickerson as our new Chief of Staff, and thank you for being my partner in this work, so thank you. Thank you very much. You have a, a series of information items on uh, your board docs at item Q. Uh, our next board meeting is August 8, and we are adjourned. Thank you.